again, and thank you so much for taking the time to be with me for today's virtual pre-concert talk. My name is Ryan Dudenbostel, and it is my honor to serve as program annotator and pre-concert lecturer for the Bellingham Festival of Music. That little piece I was playing at the beginning was a waltz by Franz Schubert, written in 1816, when Schubert was only 19 years old. Today's program features another work by Schubert and one of the great monuments of the classical canon or the romantic canon or maybe somewhere in between, his C major symphony, rightly nicknamed The Great, and most likely composed in 1825. It's usually numbered his ninth, though you'll also sometimes see it numbered as seven or eight or even ten, especially in older editions and recordings. But rather than spend 10 minutes talking about this glorious hour plus of music, I think our time would be better spent talking about the man behind it. Franz Schubert is one of those famous names we all know, one of the great figures in the pantheon of Western music. Maybe your childhood piano teacher had a little bust of him leering at you from behind his little glasses while you did your best to cover the fact that you hadn't practiced. Schubert produced an almost impossible volume of music in every medium. Over 600 songs, seven completed symphonies, many uncompleted symphonies, string quartets, chamber music, operas, and reams and reams of piano music. And he died just two months before his 32nd birthday in 1828, having heard almost none of his large-scale works. In 1825, when Schubert was writing his great C major symphony, he was 27 years old, two years younger than Beethoven was when he started work on his first symphony. But Schubert wasn't the product of the kind of carefully curated musical upbringing of Beethoven or certainly Mozart. However, he was a Vienna native, the only one among the top tier of Viennese composers to actually have been born there. And so from his first days, Schubert was steeped in all the great music, art, and culture of the imperial capital. His father, also named Franz, made a meager salary as a school teacher, and his mother, Elizabeth, was busy raising her five surviving children out of a total of 14 that she had given birth to in their one-room apartment. Little Franz was the second youngest. Though they didn't have much, the Schuberts loved music. All of them played an instrument, and their tiny apartment was filled with music in the evenings. Schubert first studied the piano from his brother, and then the violin from his father. But in both cases, it was like he knew how to play already. The music was in him. And the same was the case when he started studying with Michael Holzer, who was the organist at the Schubert family's church. Holzer told Schubert's older brother, whenever I wished to impart something new to him, he always knew it already. Schubert started composing around the age of eight. At the age of 11, he won a spot in the Imperial Boys Choir, led by Antonio Salieri a name you might recognize from the film Amadeus, though the portrayal is pretty unfair. As music director to the imperial court, Salieri was probably the most powerful musician in Vienna. And placement in his choir opened up the opportunity for Schubert to study tuition-free at the Imperial City College, where he stayed for five years and received an elite education that normally would have been completely out of reach for someone in his class. And all the while, he played and wrote music in every spare second he had. When he left school at 16, he took the practical path to become a teacher like his father and taught at his father's school until the age of 20, though he never showed much enthusiasm for it. And all the while, he wrote and wrote and wrote. The music just poured out of him especially leader or art songs, which I'll be talking about in much greater depth in my next video. 
During his teaching years, Schubert composed an average of one new song every three days. And this is while holding down a full-time job. He was just inhumanly productive. And very few of these pieces were written on commission. Most were just music he felt compelled to write at the moment. His friends described him sitting down at his desk at six in the morning and writing without a break until one in the afternoon. Schubert had an enthusiastic circle of supporters, but he never really made it. His pieces were mostly performed at small house concerts or events that Schubert himself organized, which he called Schubertiades. He tried for years to get an opera produced, and most of his orchestral music was given just one or two amateur readings and then set aside. But he just kept writing. Schubert's dedication to his work was sadly matched by a hunger for more carnal pleasures as well. And in 1823, his lifestyle finally caught up with him when he contracted syphilis. Antibiotics wouldn't be developed for another 100 years, so there was essentially no treatment. And as Schubert's health declined, he became more and more reclusive. But occasionally, his illness would subside and he would emerge for a few months of performances and travel, but other times he was confined to his house or a hospital bed. He was well enough to hear the premiere of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in 1824, if you could imagine that, and he kept writing right up through his final days, in which he would devote his lucid moments to editing publisher's proofs of his song cycle, The Winterreise, and then he was gone. What he left behind was an enormous volume of music, mostly in manuscripts, that took decades to sort through. And it was really thanks to later composers, especially Schumann and Brahms, that we know about Schubert's music at all. Both of them were instrumental in using their own prestige to get Schubert's works published and performed. And Schubert had his effect on them as well, particularly Brahms. In fact, we can hear echoes of Schubert in nearly all of Brahms's music. Or maybe a better way to put it is that we hear antecedents of Brahms in nearly all of Schubert's music. How fortunate are we then that we get to hear the final symphonies of Schubert and Brahms in two consecutive concerts this summer? So thank you so much for joining me for this introduction to Franz Schubert. I hope you enjoy his glorious C major symphony, The Great, and I look forward to seeing you next time.